Father, thank you that we can gather and sing um, about your goodness because you have been eternally, infinitely good to us by sending your son, uh, Jesus, to live the life we couldn't, to die in our place for our sin, to conquer and defeat death, that he might by grace forgive us and set us free from sin. Father, you have been good. And I know much of this life is about growing us, teaching us how to change our perspective on how we see the world around us and eternity. And so, Father, I pray today that you would bless us, that you would open our eyes, that we might be able to see and understand and perceive wonderful things about you through your word. And so I know a lot of us have come in with a lot of baggage, a lot of hurt, a lot of anxiety, a lot of wounds, a lot of pain. And so would you meet with us? Would you help us to understand your goodness and your love, even in the midst of the trials and the suffering and the pain? And so, Father, today we don't need earthly human wisdom or earthly human words. We need to hear from you. And so I confess my words mean nothing. I pray that you, through your spirit and your word, would meet with us. Would you bless us today by... um, causing us to be aware of, uh, of your love for us, your presence with us. Would you save those who don't know you? Would you sanctify and strengthen your children who do? Use this time. Would you fill me with your spirit to care for your body, for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome. Emily, thank you. Uh, welcome to Hillside. I've, I've met a whole bunch of you. It's your first time. You've never been here. And we as a church body, Tay, what's up, brother? Uh, we as a church body just want to welcome you and say we are absolutely delighted that you're here. I'll make the entire service really simple for you. Um, at Hillside, we believe Jesus changes everything. Uh, he does that through what this book calls the gospel, that Christ was crucified for our sins according to the scripture. Christ Jesus was buried and Christ Jesus rose again. If you understand what Jesus has done for you in the gospel, you have everything you need. You see, once you understand that Jesus died for your sin, all of that guilt and shame and all of that burden you've been carrying falls off. Jesus paid for it. And if he paid for it, he sets you free. And when you come to understand the good news that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again, You understand he's defeated death and therefore opened eternity and given us hope. So if he's taken care of your guilt and shame and he's taken care of your anxiety, fear, and worry, the gospel gives you peace every single day wherever you're at. And that's the truth I want to preach to you. So uh, if you're here, you wonder, what is this all about? What are these Christians doing? We just want you to know Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. Christ Jesus, the hope of the world. So that's it. This, this message that Jesus changes everything isn't hypothetical or theoretical. He starts by changing us inside. My name's Dave. Jesus has been and is changing me. I have new life in Christ, and I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic saved by grace. And I'm going to encourage you to place your faith in Jesus and give your life to Jesus today and allow him to begin writing a new story with your life. So long timers, uh, are, a lot of you are looking up at the lights. Are, are things changing? Everything's okay? Okay. I can't see your face, so it's really bright for me. Uh, And that's all right. I'll just preach to little dark shadows. There you go. I trust you're there. Uh, If you've been here for a long time, we're just walking through the prison epistles. We're in uh, the book of Colossians. Open up. Uh, We're going to read Colossians 1 verse, um, well, It's 24 through 29, even though I can't see it. (laughs) Let me read it to you. God says, Paul writes this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested or shown to the saints. 
to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. This is God's word for us that that we get to enjoy this morning. And so let me, let me give you kind of a big theological perspective as we go from verse 24 to 29. If you read straight through the Bible, and, and part of reading through the Bible is about understanding who is God? What's he like? You see, all of us wonder that. What is God like? Uh, and if you read through the Bible, one of the huge character attributes of God that would jump out to you, that's super important is this. The Bible tells us that that God's omniscient, he's all-knowing, he's infinite in his knowledge. That's That's a big deal. It means he knows everything that was, everything that is, and everything that will be. He knows everything that isn't and everything that won't be. He knows everything that can be, can't be, should be, shouldn't be. He knows it all. See, we write movies, Marvel movies, about characters like this, and we do it because there's a character like this who exists, his name is, is God. Now this is an important thing, because God knows everything, he's got a perfect eternal perspective on everything. He sees better and knows better than you and I do, amen? Now there's a small theological perspective. If you read from Genesis 3, clear to Revelation 22, once sin entered the world, it separated us from God. We're not infinite, we try to be, but we're finite. We know very little. Amen? Amen. See, I think we think we know a lot because the whole information age and chat GPT, we actually know very little, and what we do know, we forget. (laughs) Uh, It happened to me again this week. I ended up in the kitchen. I don't know how I ended up there or why I was there, but I know it took me 46 steps to get there, and that's a lot of exertion of energy, so I just sat down and waited until I remembered why I went down there. Because I know once you, right, once you go back upstairs, you'll remember, and then you'll head back downstairs and forget. It's horrible. It's age. Um, And because we know very little, our perspectives are earthly. They're very little. What this book tells us is that an infinite, eternal God wrapped himself in human flesh, and he joined us to bring an eternal perspective to this earthly world so that as earthly people, we might have this eternal perspective of what God is doing. We actually need that. You see, so many of us focus on what happens to us. And in America right now, it's all about being the biggest victim. It's a race to the bottom. Who's the biggest victim? Because the biggest victim wins. The biggest victim, and that's why everybody races. I'm the biggest victim. Oh, it's been so hard for me. Life is hard, and it's hard for all of us. There's one victim. His name is Jesus, and he chose not to be a victim. He was victorious over the circumstances, and Paul is going to show us in this life, it's not so much about what happens to me. It is about my perception, my perspective, how I interpret and apply events, Paul's going to walk us through his perspective. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. Not once do you hear him say, oh my goodness, pray that Nero has a heart attack. Pray he's out of the pit. He doesn't. He's going to show us a proper, how to have a proper perspective that it's not so much what's happening to me, but how I perceive it, interpret it, and apply it. And as humans, we often perceive, interpret, and apply things in a way that most hurts our own heart and most hurts our relationship with God. So Paul today, in all three of these points, he's gonna seek to shift our perspectives. And so I'm gonna use the scriptures to help seek shift my own perspective on suffering, on stewarding, and, and ultimately on striving, what it means to strive. And so Paul's just gonna, he's just gonna try and tweak how you think. Watch how it starts, start in verse, Verse 24, he's going to look at this overall picture of suffering, and he's going to try and shift your perspective, and he's going to start by saying, I rejoice in my suffering. Do you see it? 
Verse 24, now I what? Rejoice Rejoice in what? Is that not bizarre, odd, and awkward? How many of you, you were reading through the text this week and thought, yeah, me too, Paul, amen. (laughs) Oh, suffering comes, praise God. It's a bizarre thing for us to read in America because we're like, no, my entire life is spent avoiding trying to get around, over, under, or or insure against any kind of suffering. I don't want suffering. Paul says, no, guys, I actually rejoice in my suffering. Now, this, honestly, either Paul is mentally unwell, we got to look at the possibilities. Either he's mentally unwell, that we would call that um, a, a psychological condition, masochism, he enjoys pain. Either he's mentally unwell, or he could just be detached from reality, pie in the sky, by and by, hey, I'm going to throw out some stuff to you, I don't believe it, but I, I think you should, because it'll philosophically help. Either he's mentally unwell, detached from reality, or he's actually tapped into a deep truth that'll transform how you see the world around you, and I th- I'm convinced the third one's true. He was tapped into something deeply true. But I think you actually know this truth and understand this truth. Do you know that human beings as a whole will freely suffer for what we love? Human be- any single one, if I sat down and said, what do you really love? Let's, let's run a test. How many of you love camping? You like going out in the woods and camping? Okay, there's typically about 22% of the people Mentally unwell, I don't understand it. (laughs) If I sat you down and you said, I love camping, I would say, tell me everything that goes into it. And you would describe suffering, packing up all of your house, fitting it into your RV or camper or into your car, driving for hours out into the middle of nowhere to set up a tent right next to somebody else so that you could act like you're homeless for a weekend. And I would say, why, why would you suffer? Like, I, I work so that I don't have to ever do that. Because there's mosquitoes out there. That's why I have a home. With doors and windows so that uh, West Nile and all those mosquito-borne illnesses, why would you suffer? You would say, we love it. And we're willing to suffer. I can go on and on with this. Some of you like fishing. Where are my fishers? It's just called, it's suffering. Now, don't clap so quick, Gail. Some of you like shopping? Black Friday's coming up. See, Gail, you're clapping. I know, I didn't want to call you out because now it's on, it's eternally existent online, on the YouTube. You get up, Black Friday comes, you get up at 3.30, you run to the mall. What the mall means in Greek is suffering. (laughs) And you'll elbow people. Why why do you suffer? You come and say, I got it 87% off. It's the victory. You you see, as human beings, we suffer for what we love. It's uh, childbirth. Childbirth. Mm -hmm. I thought we were a one-and-done family. Brooke, she suffered through labor for 34 hours with our firstborn. We were working the whole Lamaze thing. I was helping her breathe. (laughs) (coughs) 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 See? (coughs) (coughs) Suffering. No, it got bad. We were like four hours into it, and I was still doing the nurses. I was turning colors. They were like, no, sir, you need to go lay down on the couch. They gave me ice chips. They they started caring for me. They're like, labor's hard. It's okay. I was convinced. And the pain of it, 34 hours, I was convinced. I was like, well, Lord, thank you for one child. I'm sure Brooke will never want to have another one. We get home, and Brooke was like, I want another one. I was like, what? (laughs) Why? Because we freely suffer for what we love. What you're willing to suffer for will in fact show you what you love. Paul said there's a spiritual high in seeing people come to Christ, seeing people be born again, seeing people grow in Jesus Christ. There is such a spiritual high, Paul says, I rejoice. I rejoice in my suffering. What you're willing to suffer for will show what you love. So I'm curious, what what are you willing to suffer for? Because I'll tell you, if it's not eternal, it's gonna leave you empty. So Paul starts out, go ahead and leave uh, verse 24 up there because we're only like four words in. Now I rejoice in my suffering 
So he rejoices in it. Why? Watch the second point, because it's relational. I rejoice in my suffering for what? For your sake. I'm suffering, but it's for your benefit, and I rejoice in my suffering because it's for your benefit. Do you understand how un-American this is? You don't yet. Let me walk you through it. In America, we seek relationships that give us something. It's actually called using people. It's called uh, being an analid, a user, a leech. That's what an analid is, biologically, zoologically speaking. I see you've got something I want, and you can give that to me. Now I love you because you can, I can get something from you. Paul says that's actually unchristian. We, as Christians, enter relationship for what we can give. You, you see, it's a shift in relationship. It's a shift in mentality. It's a shift in perspective that our nation doesn't understand. This is why we put things on our dating apps and websites, searching for someone that's fun, enjoyable, pleasant, delightful, because I'm, I, I'm like that. What honest dating apps should read is like this. I am difficult. You will have to endure me. I will give you a lot of pain, not in a good way. And you're going to have to persevere if you're going to stick with me. Put that on your dating site. <laughs> Genuinely. Because if not, you're just trying to sell yourself in someone, young ladies, a guy will see you and say, okay, I think you can give me a lot. You will enter into relationships for what you can get, not for what you can give. Paul says, man, the perspective shift is this. I rejoice in my suffering because I love the gospel, and I rejoice in it because it's for your sake. Now watch the third part. This is how we actually reach other people for Christ. He says, and, I, and in my flesh... This is such a weird statement. Paul writes stuff that you're like, Paul, what? What? You just got done for like 10 verses saying Christ is sufficient, supreme. You can't get any better than Jesus. Then he turns around and says, now in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Is that not a weird statement? Yes. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> One per It's super weird because... I know Paul's not talking about the atonement or the payment that Jesus made for sin because when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is. So when Jesus died, his death was sufficient. There's nothing lacking. So we know he's not talking about atonement. I think what he's talking about is the advancement of the gospel. That is, when Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again, he said to his boys in Matthew 28, Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. So that's the advancement of the gospel. It has nothing to do with the payment Jesus made. It had to do with the proclamation to all people. Now, I think it's as simple as the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. It, anybody? Well, look, look, two of you understand. Okay. Energy can't be created nor destroyed. It just transfers forms. And, and so for any system, any closed system to be improved, the outside system has to decrease. So it's just the conservation of energy. So let me say it this way. For the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to go from where it is right here to where it isn't out in the world, do you know what it's going to take? Affliction, suffering, we would call it work. Because you're going to have to get up, leave here, go to work, say, Jesus, would you open up opportunities? And all Paul is talking about is I'm doing my part to transfer that energy, to carry that gospel message. You see, when Jesus Christ humbled himself, he became less, he decreased and dwelt with us so that we might know the truth and increase. Paul was in prison and he decreased so that the churches might increase. And Paul says, now follow my example and suffer. And we as the church are going to decrease so that the world might have life and increase. 
Study it throughout history. Anytime there's life and goodness instilled and installed in the world, it comes through a decrease and a death in the church. This is how good God is. He built this thing called the church and said, suffer so that others might be served. Carry the gospel so that others might hear the gospel. So Paul's simply saying, man, I do my part. Um, I carry my weight so that other people might know Jesus Christ. Know this, suffering is the vehicle that God has chosen to spread salvation. It's always going to cost us something. If we're unwilling to pay, that, that gospel truth doesn't move forward. It always moves forward through suffering. Now, you may say, I don't understand why God would do that. Study the sine wave. The deeper the trough and the pain, the higher the capacity for joy. He is just preparing us for the, the greatest capacity for joy for all eternity, and we get to carry that message. So we, he, he seeks to shift our perspective on suffering. Not only that, watch verse 25. Now he's going to shift our perspective on stewarding. And I want to shift your perspective on it. In America, most of us use the word mine and my a lot. We're the center of our own story. And we think that all that what we have is ours. Job 121 would say, naked, you came from your mother's womb and naked you'll return. How much did you bring into the world with you? Nothing. How much are you taking out of this world with you? Nothing. Nothing. So everything in between is a stewardship. It all belongs to God. He's given us different amounts and said, steward it. He's given us different things to steward and said, steward it well. It's all mine. I'm entrusting it to you. Use it for the glory of God. So Paul's going to shift their perspective on stewarding, and he's going to start with the church right here. You see, many people think the church is theirs. I'm going to tell you the church is not ours, the church is not mine, the church is not the elders, the church is not yours. It's Jesus's. He purchased it with his blood and said, steward it really well. Watch what he says. Of this church, I was made a... That's a servant. He would use that word. We would translate it also deacon or waiter of tables. So Paul says, I'm just here to steward and minister or serve according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. You see, we're supposed to steward this thing. And it matters how every single member of the church stewards this thing. In America, we tend to view the church as something we consume. We come and what can we get? How is the coffee? How is the parking? How is the seating? How is the temperature? How is the sermon? And, and we've been taught to consume. And oftentimes it's the pastor and leadership's fault because we find our identity by more numbers. And so we just want people to feel comfortable so that they'll come and feel comfortable and consume so the church grows so we feel better. And it's this sick cycle that happens. Paul says it's not about size or growth. I'm a servant and a steward of the church because the church is the best, it's the light of the world so that people might see the gospel lived out as we serve one another and care for one another. As we show up, use our gifts, and pour out, he is going to Motel 6, Tom Bodette this junk to the world. Anybody, Tom Bodette? Thank you. We'll leave best ad campaign ever. I've never, I've never stayed at a Motel 6. They look kind of shady. <laughs> but the best ad campaign ever, God said, I'm going to leave the light on for you, just like Tom Bodette, because there's, there's something about the light shining that draws lost people in. The church is to be stewarded really well. Friends, it's astounding what's happened because we see the church as something to consume. It's about me. Did I like it? How, what? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ shining brightly in a lost and dying world and letting that light shine so that more people might come into the kingdom of God, have their perspectives shifted. It's not about you and I. It's about him. So Paul says, we're all responsible for stewarding 
serving, ministering our gifts in the body of Christ. Not only the church, watch what comes next on, in 25. According to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Now, this is opinion, but I think the preaching of the word of God has fallen on hard times in our day. Because we, I, we cherry pick verses, we take verses, and then we'll use verses to get people to do what we want them to do. Have, you, have any of you ever felt used by the Bible instead of served by like as people say, hey, you need to do more, you should do more, you should give more. Here's what the Bible says now. Have any of you ever felt used, hurt, harmed, or abused by somebody using the Bible to use you? See, it's huge in America, and trust in the Bible is going down because pastors don't use it properly or well or wisely. Paul says, hey, I'm here to serve you by preaching the word of God. Now, he defines that and explains it by explaining the whole Bible. Watch verse 26 and 27. That is, when he talks about preaching the word of God, what's he talking about? That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations. That's the Old Testament. Jesus Christ was concealed in the Old Testament, but has now been manifest to his saints. Verse 27, watch this. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Here's how he sums up the whole Bible, the preaching of the word of God, which is Christ in you, y'all, that's plural, the hope of glory. So as Paul says, man, I long to preach the word of God, it wasn't telling people be better, do better, try better, show up more, serve more, give more, do more, exhaust yourself more, do what I tell you to do. When he preaches the whole word of God, do you know what he says? Christ has come to dwell in you. Do you, know what a, do you know what a mystery that is? The infinite God come to dwell in you? Oh, we don't get it. So let me explain it to you. Do you know you were born separated from God and therefore you had a profound black hole and vacuum inside of you? And you spent the first 20, 30, or 40 years trying to fill that. Oftentimes through substances, pleasure, work, significance, status, position, prominence, power. But you were like Pac-Man going through this world. Chomp, 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 chomp. And just like Pac-Man, you never got filled up. See, you were born with flat tires. It looked like everything should work but you had flat tires, empty tires. So you, your car would not go forward, metaphorically speaking, because the air was out of it. Sin had separated you from God. So do you know, how many of you have ever had a flat tire? Okay, pretty much all of us, this is good. Anybody have a can of fix a flat in your car? It's beautiful, you just screw up. It'll only give you like eight pounds of pressure, but it's enough to get to discount tire. It's wonderful because it's a sealant and a fix that you put in the tire to fill it up. You were born separated, dead in your trespasses and sins, separated from God. And what did he do? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to remove your sin, clean you up inside so that he might move in and renovate your life and patch all the cracks so that you might experience abundant life. This is what the word of God is about. It is good news. See, some of you think the Bible's a rule book where God says, do more, bad you, shame on you, try harder. That's not what the Bible's about, yo. I read the whole thing. It's no matter how hard you try, you can't do enough. So Jesus Christ came to do it for you that he might live in you, that he might live through you, that he might seal you and secure you for all eternity. And Paul says, that's the perspective shift. It's not about you. And Paul says, this is why I'm here to preach the word of God, which is Christ in you. And once Christ lives in you, you've got this hope of glory that Jesus Christ is gonna change everything for all eternity. And he literally uses that to change you from the inside out. Not from the outside in, that's religion. Inside out is relational. 
God says, I'm going to change you from the inside out. Not only the church, watch verse 28. Beautiful. So Paul says, we proclaim him admonishing every, uh, uh, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we might present every man complete in Christ. Many of us have been wounded by other people. How many of you carry people wounds? How many have been hurt by other people? Because of this, we oftentimes create distance and we keep space because other people hurt. Other people wound us. In fact, I would guarantee you, if I had time with each one of you, you would walk through how your family had wounded you and hurt you and how your neighbors had wounded you and hurt you and how the church and people in the church had wounded you and, and hurt you. Paul says, I want to I shift your perspective. Yes, we all wound and hurt one another. And this is where we show the beauty of the gospel because we get together and we get to grow together in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we gather together, one of the things Paul says we do is we proclaim whom? Jesus. Now, I don't have time for this, but it is interesting. He just shifted pronouns on you. It was I, 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 Paul is talking about himself, and now in verse 28, he says, we are going to do something. It's not just what the preacher does. It is the body. When we get together and we love one another and we serve one another and we care for one another, we are proclaiming Christ. You see, we, we expect for people to come in and just hear the gospel and respond, They've got to hear it and see it and experience it and taste it. They've got to be ultimately um, absolutely surrounded and dipped in it to see the reality of it. So Paul says, we together, through our life, we proclaim him. And we do something. This is what the church does for the church. He's talking about believers here. We proclaim him, how? How? Admonishing every man. Do you know what admonishing is? Yeah, it's warning. Thou shalt not. It's, it's danger. Hey, God designed things a certain way. The Bible says don't do this, so don't do it. Now, the world doesn't like that. They're like, don't tell me what to do. That's fine. You know there's admonitions everywhere. You, oh, you don't know that? I was, I was pondering this first this morning as I was drinking water. And then, I looked, and then I looked down. Do you know what I saw? An admonition. Notice the small cap that we have created to reduce the amount of plastic in the environment. Warning. Do not swallow this cap or the ring. It can be dangerous for your health. They printed that on every label. Admonishing you, don't eat this. What, what kind of, what's happened to us? What is wrong with us? Well, Dave, it's not for us, it's the children. The children can't read. It's not for the kids. This is for adults. Don't eat it. Now, in this world, why do we have to be admonished not to eat a plastic cap because it'll choke us and kill us? Because apparently somebody did it one time and sued Costco. Because, why? Because... Sin has made us stupid. It's made us foolish. So what, does we, what do we do as the church? We admonish people. Now, for my non-believing friends and the atheist friends who are here, you would say, I don't like being admonished. Don't tell me what to do. We do it all the time to everyone. I understand we have different worldviews, but we're going to admonish people. God made us in his image. He made sex good but it's to be enjoyed within the covenant of one man, one woman for one lifetime, and I admonish you, until you're married, keep your pants on. Let's function according to design. And I know the world would say, oh, that is so hurtful and harmful. 
I can't believe you would say that. I would say, you've been admonished. Let me know how it works out for you. It's, it's okay, you don't believe it. But we're going to admonish and say, here's what God says. We're gonna warn one another because that's what loving parents do, isn't it? It's what loving communities do. I've had to admonish all my kids. I would come downstairs and my kids would be eating out of the trash can like raccoons. <laughs> they did not get that from me. I don't know where they picked it up. Not Brooke either. Some weird genetic uh, strain in our family tree where our kids were eating out of the trash can and I had to admonish them. Don't. It's bad. Oftentimes in church, we have to say, don't eat out of the trash can. It's bad. Not only are we going to admonish, but we're going to teach. This is the positive thing. Friends, this is a little bit every single week, again, encouraging people, find your life in Christ, find your joy in Christ, find your hope in Christ. It's a perspective shift because this growth takes decades and not days. It takes decades, you don't believe me? This is why God made us as altricial beings and not precocial beings. Anybody study biology? No. Precocial beings are born, and it's from the Latin precocious, like the blue wildebeest. Anybody study it? Profound animal. It's born within seven minutes. It's running within an hour and a half. It's feeding itself, and it's on its own. Can you imagine being a, a mama blue wildebeest? You have the baby. The baby's, oh, baby's doing well. It's off to college, first hour. Good. <laughs> That's precocial. Do you know what humans are? There's a scale. Precocial, you're off and doing it within minutes. You know what altricial is? It takes us 18 years. <laughs> and the percentage is most of us still don't launch after 18 years. Our, pre our, our prefrontal cortex, our frontal lobe, we don't develop until 25. And only the, the rental car companies know it. They won't rent to you till you're 25 because they're like, no, you're still dumb. You're 24? Uh-uh. No, we're not going to get you. We're not. No, you can't rent a car. You'll crash it. We have to pour out, pour out, pour out for decades. Why? Because love suffers. Love costs. And it builds us together and we teach one another. It takes decades, not days. Let me land the plane with this. 40 seconds over. We'll go 29. Now he's going to shift our perspective on striving. He says, for this, for this purpose, advancement of the gospel, for the church to grow and be admonished and taught, I also what? This is a funny, Paul's telling a joke in the Greek and only the people studying along in the Greek. He's, labor is copious. Um, I, I am sweating with copious stress over this. Uh, uh, I, for this purpose, I... Copiously agonize is what he says. I, I labor and strive, but it's according to his power which mightily works within me. Isn't this confusing? Anybody else confused by this? We Christians don't get it. We're like, wait, uh, hold on. So who does this Christian thing? Does God do it? And some of us would say, absolutely. It's my let go and let God crowd. We let go and we let God. Hakuna Matata, amen? God's going to do it. What do you do? I let God do it. And I do my thing and I let him do it. Let go and let God. That crew fights with the A-type, if it is to be, it's up to me crowd. Where are my A-typers? Because we're like, no, if it is to be, it's up to me. Forget Hakuna Matata. Go about your serenity prayer all you want. Somebody's got to do it, and all right, you're going to let me do it, and we get it done. And then there's other people. They're more the GMs, the general managers. We don't do it, but we're here to tell you to do it. So it's, we're like, no, it's not Hakuna Matata, and it's not if it is to be, it's up to me. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to tell you to do it. You should do it. And Christians don't get along because we're all confused. Who does this thing? Does God do it? Do I do it? Do you do it? But somebody's got to do it. How do we do it? And we're such a mess because God says, yes. Well, do you do it? Yes. Do I do it? Yes. Do we do it? Yes. And we're going to do it together. Mm. <laughs> Let's just keep it simple, right? Because whenever I include my kids and stuff, the mess gets bigger. So if you want to do it, God, you do it. 
If you want me to do it, just say do it. I'm up to it. Or if you want me to tell them to do it, tell me to tell them to do it and they'll do it. But how is this all going to blend together? God says, yes, it's a beautiful mess meant to build relationship. It's, it is confusing. Very confusing. Anybody ever flown on a plane, gone to an airport? Like six of you. Man, Texans, it is. Everything's bigger. I don't need to leave Texas. Everything is here. It's the promised land. If you ever go to the airport, you'll find this thing called an auto walk or a moving sidewalk. In England, they call it the travelator. Anybody seen the moving sidewalk? We all ride the moving sidewalk different. The thing about the moving sidewalk is the moving sidewalk's always moving. And the energy is supplied and it moves. If you're ever stuck in an airport, just watch the travelator, the moving side. It's hilarious. Some people don't do well getting onto it. They don't, do they? It's like double Dutch for them. They're, like, they're trying to figure out how to do it. And they get on, it's like, ah, ah, ah. It's like they're surfing. I want to take pictures of it. I'm like, ah, oh, poor person. I, I, it's hard. Some people get on and they're purposeful. They walk. Don't they? You've seen the walkers on the travelator? They're using the power of the travelator, but they're amplifying it. Now, some people, super A types, if it is to be, it's only up to me. They'll get on and they don't skip a beat. They'll jump right on and they're running. And they get there even faster. But then there's some people who get on and they stop. They're still moving, but they're just enjoying the ride. There's some that get on in pairs and they block. There's the blockers. Now the blockers and the walkers do not get along. The blockers and the runners, there's conflict, open conflict. <laughs> Passing on the right and people are like, oh my goodness, it's a runner. <laughs> the, the thing about the travelator or moving sidewalk is everybody who gets on is moving forward. Now my children get on, they run backwards. It's like a treadmill and they just love it. Some Christians do that. They get on the travelators. You see, justification by grace through faith, Jesus puts us on the moving sidewalk and you're moving He's doing his work in you. You're getting to the point he wants you to get. Now, some of us stop, some of us block, some of us walk, and some of us run. But Jesus Christ is doing that work to move us forward. Now, we get to, we get to decide how are we going to function together on this travel later that we're on? How are we going to love each other? You know we can fuss and fight on that travel later? My kids have been there. We can... We can make it an epic mess, or we can have fun, be faithful, follow the faithful one, love one another fervently from the heart, and be being transformed and following Jesus, being changed by him as he moves us forward. Let me land the plane with this. Paul's wanted to shift our perspective. I know a lot of you are walking through a lot of pain. I want to show you the greatest perspective shift ever. Because you're here wondering, how can Jesus use this suffering, this difficulty, and this pain for good? The greatest perspective shift in all the world you're about to celebrate in communion. You see, we're about to remember and celebrate the greatest evil and the greatest suffering ever endured and perpetrated on this earth when the sinless Son of God was nailed to a cross. When Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, was made to be sin. That's the greatest evil that this world has ever seen. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the greatest suffering. That was eternal love shattered, broken, removed, separated. There's never been greater suffering than that. And yet we celebrate it and remember it. Why? Because God used the greatest evil and the greatest suffering to bring about the greatest good this world has ever seen. Through Jesus enduring and suffering and bearing that evil in his body on that tree, God brought about the greatest salvation, the greatest good this world has ever seen, the salvation of billions of people throughout the ages. You see, what you're about to celebrate should shift your perspective. If God can use the greatest evil and the greatest suffering in the world, surely he can use my suffering and whatever evil's been done for me. As we move into communion, would you ask him to shift your perspective on what you're walking through? Because this life is not so much about what happens to us, 
but how we perceive it, how we understand it, how we interpret it, and how we apply it. I wonder if you would lay that suffering down and say, Jesus, would you use that suffering for your glory, for my good, for our good, to grow the body of Christ. As Ben comes up, let me pray. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love for us. The fact that you, you didn't simply tell us to trust you with suffering, but you showed us through your son that suffering and pain can be redeemed and used for good. This morning, would you shift and change our perspectives even now as we celebrate communion, as we remember you, Jesus? Would you help loosen our grip on those parts and pieces of our story that we're holding on to suffering and pain? Would you open our eyes to how you long to use that to grow us and to reach other people with the gospel? Strengthen Ben now as he leads us in communion. Would you open our eyes to the beauty and the love of what Jesus did for us. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Love you, bud.